Welcome to the community work, community homeworks workshop this evening. We're so glad that you are joining us tonight. My name is Tiana Harrison and I'm the education and volunteer coordinator at Community Homeworks. If you're watching this live, please feel free to comment and let us know where you're tuning in from. And if you would like to join us in on the discussion please, to ask a question, please put that in the comments as well. If you're watching this after the live broadcast, we're still happy to answer your questions. It just may take us a little longer to respond. Community Homeworks is a nonprofit organization with the mission to empower homeowners to maintain safe, sustainable, and dignified homes. We get our funding from grants, gifts, and donations. So if you find value in this workshop tonight, we encourage you to donate on our website at communityhomeworks.org. Tonight's workshop is Introduction to Hand Tools, and our instructor is Mr. Lee Taylor. Mr. Taylor, thank you for being here. We look forward to learning more about hand tools tonight. All right. Thank you. And you can hear me all right? Okay. All right. Uh, like Hannah said, uh, this is you know Intro to Hand Tools, and if you have questions, please type them in. Uh, I'll try to be able to answer them best I can. Uh, the thing about hand tools is, is that there are so many hand tools. It is, it really is overwhelming. Uh, so we're going to be going over just the, the basics of, you know, what most people should have at least uh, a starter for, you know, for their home. Um, the thing about hand tools is, is that if there's a problem out there or some, some kind of uh, uh, tool that will make life easier, they most likely have a hand tool made for it so um there it, it just really is endless as far as the hand tools go so i'm gonna get going because we have quite a bit we need to go over uh i want to start off with uh, some of the basic safety things first um gloves are one of those things that you want to have when using, uh, you know, when, whenever you're working with stuff, and there's a variety of types of gloves. You have, you know, your leather gloves, your dipped cloth style gloves, your grippy gloves, all sorts of different styles. The main thing with those is just make sure they fit. Uh, you don't want to be wearing them and have, you know, excess uh, fabric or leather or anything like that hanging off. It can turn into a safety hazard uh, as far as grabbing items and that sort of thing. But um, and sometimes you're going to find that, you know, wearing gloves, uh, can actually impede using some hand tools. So, but having them, you know, you have to think about that as far as part of your hand tool set. Another thing is safety glasses or goggles. So like I said, different types, different styles out there. Uh, the main thing with safety glasses or goggles is you want to make it so that they are comfortable. Uh, if they're not comfortable, they're not going to do anything for it you know if they're sitting on top of your head they don't do a thing um so you know sometimes you're going to spend a little bit more on a quality pair um you know sometimes pieces of uh, glasses like this will fit over uh some smaller you know prescription style lenses that sort of thing but again you want to make sure that they are uh they're rated it's a z87 usually they'll be stamped there's a little, little stamp on this one here that says that that's an impact rating um you want to make sure they are rated for you know a safety glass and that they're comfortable and he said if they're not comfortable they're not going to do a thing so you know he said take your time and find a good pair for that some of the other small little details i'll pick on this guy real quick so seems like a basic thing right but, you, you know, it's nice to have some kind of a, a tool belt or some kind of a, an item to hold things. You know, this is your basic tool nail, you know, nail apron, they call them. You know, what to do is most people will tie them. Trick with these is what you want to do is I loop it like this and I'll loop it one more time. And I'll just make a bow in it. The reason I do that is if I'm putting hand tools or whatever else in it. It's not going to come loose on me. Some have little, you know, loops for hammers and stuff like that. But double looping it like that is going to make it so the thing's not going to be coming loose and you're up on a ladder or on a roof or something along that line and you're having to play with your uh, thing. 
to be able to hold all your tools. And like I said, this is a basic style, but like I said, there's lots of different styles out there. Uh, and that's really up to you. It's a personal preference thing. So just makes your life a little bit easier. Now, as far as the basic, basic tools, I'm going to, I, I, there's a whole variety of tools here that you can see. And like I said, we're, we're not going to really be touching on all these. I just want to kind of do a, a quick introduction on what I consider, what I consider to be some of the most basics. And again, this is really for, this is for somebody who is looking to create a toolbox, whether they're, uh, you know, whether they're a homeowner or just a renter, or they just do little side projects, uh, craft projects, whatever, uh, you know, some of these tools are what you're really going to want. The other thing I want to talk about with hand tools is don't go out and buy the toolbox first. <laughs> and that's what I'm talking about. And you said lots of different styles of toolboxes out there. They have plastic ones, metal ones, all sorts of things, right? Generally, what I'm going to say is kind of go through and pick out what tools you want. And then you can pick the size of the toolbox to be able to, uh, you know, handle the amount of tools that you have. And some people even like to break them down into smaller toolboxes to make it so that one toolbox is this specific type and the other is this. And also, too, if you put them all into one, you know, you can get some toolboxes. I have one at home that's this long and like this and like this. And every time I pick it up, my arm stretches about two inches, it feels like. So, uh, you know, like I said, sometimes getting the tools first and then working on what toolboxes you want are a nice thing. Um, like I said, plastic metal really doesn't matter. The one thing I'm going to talk about really real quick with these is you want ones with a tray on top that makes it nice. Like you said, this one fits right inside here. That way you can put some of the smaller items in there and be able to access them. Metal toolboxes are fine. You're going to find these all over the place. The only issue is, see the bottom of this, especially if you go out and you buy one at a garage sale or something, uh, they have a tendency to get a little bit rough, and the metal has a tendency to get a little bit uh, destructive at times. And I've seen it where somebody is doing a really nice project, and they go... And they slam that toolbox down and they shove it across something and now they got more work because the bottom of their toolbox tore it up. Put those little felt pads on the bottom of it if you're going to be setting that toolbox potentially down on something that is finished or you don't want to have to refinish. You know, like I said, those cheap felt pads you can stick on the bottom of things work very nice for that. Um, as far as your basics on tools, I'm going to pick on tape measures first because that's usually the biggest thing that most people have. Um, there are all different types of tape measures out there. This is a 25 foot, one inch, meaning one inch wide tape. You look at it, I like this style because what it does is it breaks it down into, you know, your eights, your quarters, your three eighths, halves, all that sort of stuff. So that's nice. You're going to find ones out there also that are into metric. Hey, if you use metric, great. Most people, at least around here, don't, but they are out there. So sometimes that can get a little confusing. And sometimes you're going to find one with metric on one side and, uh, you know, the other, uh, bureau or whatever on the other side. So, but a 25 foot tape measure is usually going to be just about right. Uh, one of the things, if you want to kind of do a test, on a tape measure, I say at least six foot. You should be able to at least send it out six foot without it breaking like that. Uh, the reason for that is just, it, and again, it's a safety thing. So if I'm having to, if I'm standing on a ladder or something like that and I need to extend this thing out to be able to hook it on and by myself or for whatever reason, I can extend that out and get pretty far actually. So. That is one of those things. The other thing with tape measures is uh, sometimes you don't necessarily need, I have this is my personal one, this is a 35 footer. Um, they start getting, you can get much bigger ones than this even. But again, you know, the longer the tape, the more you're going to spend for it. And, you know, do you really need one that's quite that big? So, you know, it, it depends on what kind of projects you're working on. So, like I said, you want to kind of keep that in mind. Um, 
a lot of the tape measures, a lot, at least a lot of the name brands, they do or they may have uh, warranties on them as far as breakage warranties and stuff. So that's one of those things you want to kind of look into and ask about. So like I said, all different types of tape measures. And we're going to get into, I think, in our next class, more details on some of these tools that I'm talking about as far as care and all that sort of stuff also. Um, the other is hammers. You said large variety of hammers here. Basically, they boil down to weight. If six, these are both 16 ounces. This is a 19 ounce. This is a little 12 ounce or something. I can't even see it. <laughs> um, and then you have style. So you have what's called a rip claw. I'm sorry. This is a rip claw. This is a version of a rip claw. You can see how this claw, this hammer is straight out versus this guy, curve claw like this. If you have a choice, get the rip claw. It doesn't affect anything, but it makes that tool so much more useful. It's just one of those things. <laughs> you just, it, believe me, trust me. The other thing is, is, uh, you know, the handle style. When I'm talking about that, it's, you know, there's fiberglass, there's wood, there's metal, this sort of thing. Um, if you're buying these, say, like at a garage sale or something along that line, what you want to look at is you want to pick that hammer up and you want to see if this head is loose at all. If it's loose at all, I wouldn't mess with it, really. The other is, is that sometimes, and you can see it on this one. I don't know if you can see this, how this whole head is tilted down. That happens to these a lot. This is, is a uh, hollow tube. And it's just been hit one too many times. And what happens is, is this bends. This is going to break right here if this were to be can continue to be used. So small details like that if you're using them or if you're buying them used. Uh, again, we'll get into those uh, with a little more details uh, at one of our later classes. So he said hammers. Oh, it is next week. Well, see, next week. <laughs> so, like I said, hammers. And like I said, hammers are one of those things that are pretty, you know, you ask 10 people, you're going to get 10 different answers. So the other thing I think that is real important like I said, this is a large variety. Some of these tools I have, they're just miniatures, but you can find larger versions of these. Um, I'm going to say your slip joint pliers like this, all different brands out there. Generally, I'm going to say you need about two of these. Um, the reason is, is that, you know, if you're holding on to a pipe or something along that line, half the time you have to hold on to the other side of it to keep that thing from spinning so like a slip joint pliers like this this size generally is going to be just about good but you want to have two of these um because you will hit that that uh situation where you're going to need that so like i said pair good couple of good pair of slip joint pliers adjustable wrenches these are always handy to have and again larger smaller you're going to want those two, in my opinion, on that. Because like I said, you're going to, you're going to get into situations where you need to have that space. And a smaller one or a larger one just will not do that. So a couple of slip joint pliers. Locking style pliers or vice grips. Adjustable here. And I can lock down onto something. And it will stay. I can, then I can have a set of hands free and then release it. And again, these come in all different lengths and stuff. Generally, the longer the tool, the more force it's gonna have, that sort of thing. So a pair of locking joint pliers is always nice to have. The other is, I'm gonna say side cutters. So these are side cutters. Again, this is a very small one. Generally, these side cutters are, are you know, this size, right? Uh, but these little side cutters like this are nice. But you can buy a tool, this is what we call linesman pliers sometimes, with this flat nose on them. And it's got a pair you can grab on, but it also has a pair of cutters on the side. So some of these hand tools are dual purpose. So, you know, do you really need to have one of these if you have something like this with a pair of the cutter on the side? Not really. So sometimes you're going to be able to combine those tools, depending on where you find them. So like I said, a pair of pliers, stuff like that. 
Um, as far as socket sets, so this is your basic, basic socket set right here. You know, you know like I said, this is a really simple one. Um, I like garage sales personally because you're always going to go in and you're going to find like a grab bag of all different types of sockets and nut drivers and all sorts of things in there. So, you know, you can buy this stuff piecemeal. And, you know, the biggest thing is that you just have a relatively complete set. Like I said, we were doing a lawnmower class the other day. And sometimes you're going to find sizes that you need to have for that. Or you're putting together, uh, you know, a project at home, like a you build it sort of furniture or something along that line. Socket sets are always very nice to have. But again, very easy to find at those uh, at garage sales and all that stuff, too. Screwdrivers. Got to watch the time. <laughs> so screwdrivers. So you have all different types. Now, for your everyday use ones, I'm going to suggest either 6-in-1. This is a 6-in-1. This is a 10-in-1. So why do they call them that? What they mean by that is I have two sizes. I have a number one Phillips, number one flat. And then this is a nut driver. And then on the other side, it's a, a larger size with a number two Phillips and number two flathead. So like I said, this is nice because you can flip these around and it really, you know, saves a, a decent amount of space in there. So that's a six and one. You have what's called a ten and one. You don't see these as often, but same concept. Difference is, is that they're a little smaller. I have that size there. I pull this out. I have that size there. And I have, so you can see that size, nut driver, that size, nut driver. I can flip it around to Phillips, flathead all sorts of things and then the other side has the same thing where i can pull these out and have a variety of different types of drivers and nut drivers right yeah they have torques and all sorts of things i'm going to say this about these sometimes finding these little these little ones here they have this little ball in them that's what keeps them in you know keeps them in these Sometimes finding those can be a little bit difficult. And you don't want to get those confused with, oh, what I just saw. <laughs> these. These are what you'd use for power tools. And you see with these, they don't work because they don't have a little ball. They may fit in there, but it's nothing going to keep them in there. They'll just slide out. That's what that little ball does. So, like I said, six and ones, eight and ones, ten and ones, all sorts of things like that are great, but sometimes it can be a little difficult finding those replacements. But sometimes they're under warranty. And I had it where I had one that was under warranty, and I went looking for, you know, another one like this because it had stripped out over time. And they say, you know, I was looking for these. And they said, no, no, it's, so the whole thing's under warranty. So I brought my whole piece in. They gave me a whole new one. So, again, sometimes asking is nice to be able to ask that question as far as uh, how that's going to be, how that warranty is going to be used. Along with what you want are some longer screwdrivers, generally a Phillips and a flathead. We talk about this in, like, toilet repair and stuff like that. Again, so you're not sticking your hand either in cold water or you have, you know, a lot more reach and length to be able to get in there. I've seen it where some people even put, uh, it will magnetize these or like tape a magnet to it so that they're not losing their whatever they're trying to get in. So like I said, a couple of long screwdrivers, generally uh, a Phillips and a flathead are going to be good just to be able to get into areas you can't reach and vice versa. Little stubbies like this, again, a little flathead, a little Phillips, to be able to get into those tight areas sometimes. Uh, generally, if you have, you know, something like this in your toolbox is nice. 
They have ones also that have um, they're similar to like a six and one or something along that line, where you can change out the the bits. It may have a little magnetic holder, and it holds bits similar to what I was showing you here. So, like I said, sometimes those are real nice. So, like I said, screwdrivers are always one of those things you're going to always need. And here's details on screwdrivers, but we'll get into those in the next class. So on that note of screwdrivers, so this is, I don't know, people call them jewelers kits or eyeglass kits or whatever. Uh, this is a, this is actually a pretty nice one. Um, it's got all different sizes, very small flatheads. I mean, down to little guys like this. I don't even know if you can really even see that, you know. But this is one of those things where when you need these, you need them. Little set screws, things like that. So, I mean, you don't necessarily need to get quite this big, but they sometimes sell them in little smaller kits. Um, they are wonderful to have because, again, you know, most of the time when you look at even the smallest screwdriver on these, it's just not going to fit. So having a kit like this is nice. So that you can get into those areas. So, all right. I want to talk about levels next. So, with levels, um, again, all sorts of levels out there. Generally, if you're using a level, you want to use the longest level you can possibly use. It's going to give you a truer reading. But for, you know, for, again, for just general home use, uh, what's called a torpedo level, little short guy, 11, 12 inches long, generally going to do really good. I do want to show you a detail on this, though. So you can, I don't know if you can see this. This has a V-groove cut into it right here. Now, why does it have a V-groove cut in? Well, I don't have a pipe. But sometimes, if you're on a rounded surface, I could put that on that rounded surface. It probably won't stay on my finger. Yeah, no. I could put that little V groove onto that rounded surface and it's going to stay a little bit easier. Also, they will have, uh, sometimes they're going to have magnets on them. So, like I said, that will make it so that you, it'll free up your hands to be able to work on whatever. So, like I said, a little torpedo level like that is going to work out really nice. Um, doesn't matter if it's plastic, doesn't matter if it's metal. You just want them to read true. So let's, I'm going to pick on you. I'm going to pick on this and say, let's say you have one and you don't know if it's really reading right. How do you tell? Take it into your local store. Tell them, hey, I'm bringing this in. I just want to check something. They'll say, okay. And they may put a sticker on it or whatever. Go to the rack and get a new one. What you want to do is you can stack them like this and they both should read the same. If they read the same, then you know that this guy's in pretty good shape. Because as they get dropped and stuff, they can get a little bit out of whack. So if you have an older level or something along that line, you want to see if it's accurate. That's a simple way to be able to do it. Uh, the other one is a two-foot level. Um, you know, he said two-foot levels generally, again, you know, for most projects, work very well. Uh, you're, you're getting into some larger projects and stuff like that. You then you're getting up to the four foots and you're getting up to the six foots and the longers, you know. So, uh, but generally, home use two footer torpedo level work out very nice. So, hacksaws. I want to talk about hacksaws real quick. Hacksaws are one of those things. You know, it's just a good standby as far as uh, just something good to have. Like I said, this is your basic generic style uh, hacksaw. It's adjustable, so you can adjust it to different lengths of the blade. You know, this one you can tip. Some of them, what they'll do is they'll actually the blade will tip. So let's say you're cutting like the bolts on a toilet or something like that. You're not doing this, trying to, you know, rack your knuckles and everything else. You can actually rotate that blade out a little bit. And again, all variety types, all that sort of stuff as far as the hacksaws go. Uh, you can get your basic to up to really nice ones where they store the blades in the handle and in the top part and everything else. 
little mini hacksaw like this again sometimes space is a big issue uh, you just need to get into a very small area to be able to cut something out so a little mini hacksaw like this is really nice for that uh, like I said blade wears out you just unscrew this pull out the blade uses the same style blades that your normal hacksaws do and it makes it so you can get into those tight areas sometimes where this this may not fit so to me that is one of those things that is really nice to be able to have all right utility knives so all sorts of utility knives out there so you have this style where it has the blade you can snap off the blades so as you know when this one dulls out i can bring this down and get a pair of oh let's say flat nose pliers like this that's why i like these i shouldn't be doing this without a safety glasses on and you can snap that off throw that somewhere where you're not going to find it later that's why i like these flat ones and now you have a nice fresh blade you can also extend it out and be able to lock it to be able to make deeper cuts into whatever material you're working with so something like this is great then they have replacements and all this and they have all different styles there's one here and there's replacement blades for them you have this style here this is, has the retractable you know right here your blade comes out that's actually broken the only issue i have with this style of utility knife is that people don't change the blades out because to change the blade out you have to get your screwdriver unscrew this open it up try not to disturb this right get your new blade out put the blade in put it back in make sure this still closes and moves and then be able to close it back up so what happens is people just don't do that so then they end up using a really dull blade so if you have one like this we'll get into how you actually do it and some tricks you can do or what you do is when if you buy one buy one where you can get that blade out on its own you're not having to pull that thing apart sometimes a little button on the side where i can push it and pull that blade out sometimes it's this push it forward and i can pull that blade out flip it put another blade in then that way you're going to have a nice sharp blade because again you know a tool like this can turn dangerous real quick if you have a dull blade that just no one wants to ever change out me personally i like these so i have one like this where you can see i've used it but what i can do is i can pull this down i can pull this blade out and put that right back in now i have a nice sharp blade i can even if i need to extend it out i can't close it at that point but i have a nice decent blade i can close it up and put it in my pocket it's one of those tools that you end up using all, almost all the time so like i said utility knives super handy to have the other is i want to say allen wrenches so your basic allen wrench set i don't like the ones that are loose uh the main reason is is that they just get lost so i like these in sets like i said all different styles and everything else um you want to have a standard set and you want to have a metric set like i said these are you know you pick out what you need and like i said talking about like putting together furniture and that sort of stuff you're really going to need these but it gives you a nice handle to be able to use and leverage and everything else and it's nice because generally these are the most common sizes you're going to need yes there are bigger ones out there longer ones all sorts of things but again i like these or something like this that makes it so that i'm not going to lose them because like i said you'll have those kits where you can pull it out and you have that separate allen wrench and that's nice but i pretty much guarantee that the one you need will be the one that's out and totally lost somewhere so like i said have a set like this where you really can't lose them so having a set of allen wrenches like that is a, a really nice thing to be able to have We'll talk about flat bars so a flat bar and again this is this is your basic you know 12 inch style flat bar lots of things you can do with this uh you know you said you can get in there and pry things out you can pull nails this is designed to actually cut through nails you're doing demo work 
you can pry up like this. You can make it a fulcrum and you can stand on it to be able to lift up something. Lots of things that you can do with these flat bars. Like I said, flat bar like this generally is going to be pretty handy, um, in my opinion, as far as just the amount of things that you can do with it. Um, I like the 12 inch ones because again, you can get some that are really long and I'm not talking crowbars. I'm talking flat bars. Uh, you can get some that are really long and the problem is they don't fit in a toolbox generally, unless you get one of those very, very large toolboxes. And again, you get one like that, you're going to be stretching your arm out. So keep that in mind, but flat bars are really nice to be able to have many, many uses with those things. This tool. It's a five and one scraper. So like I said, you can, you know, a lot of people count this as a paint paint tool, and it is. You know, this area here is for scraping out excess off your roller. This is for scraping off something that you need to get into. You know, it's a pretty durable scraper. I can get in there and scrape that out. This here is to get in to be able to scrape out whatever paint can, lids, all sorts of things. Um this is one of those tools you end up using more often than you think you should. Uh, and, and most hand tools are that way. Uh, like you said, you know, there are ways to abuse them, but there are also creative ways to be able to use them. And like you said, some of that is what we're going to start getting into. But a little uh, 5 one scraper like that, to me, is great, along with like a putty knife, something along that line. And that's one thing I didn't grab out because I forgot. So I like a little putty knife. Um, you can see the difference with the putty knives. Like you said, width and all this is, is one thing. I like these narrower ones, uh, yeah, up to a two, two and a half inch, usually because you're dipping into something. If they're real wide, you have a hard time getting whatever you need to get out of a container or something along that line. But the other thing I like with putty knives is you want one that has a little bit of flex to it. You can see me flexing this versus this guy here. This is more of a scraper. You wouldn't want to necessarily use this as a putty knife. Putty knife like that, when it has a little bit of flex, is going to give you a smoother application of whatever it is that you're putting on. So like I said, a couple of different styles of putty knives, different widths, that sort of thing, uh, is a nice thing to have. Watching the time here. <laughs> so stud finders. All different types of stud finders out there. Um, you got to be careful with stud finders. Uh, sometimes I call them liars. But they, you know, I mean, what you're going to be doing is, you know, you're using it to actually find either, uh, you know, like a wooden stud in a wall. Some will show you where electrical lines are or plumbing lines and stuff like that. Um, some you're going to spend more on some where they're going to go deeper into whatever material you're looking at. You know, sometimes you're, you're dealing with an older house that may be plaster walls or something along that line, and your plaster may be that thick before you get into even, you know, the lath and then whatever else is behind the wall. So the thing with stud finders is they are nice, but don't automatically trust them. I, I, I say that just from experience is, you know, I have multiples at home and, you know, I'm going to run it. I'm going to check it. But what I'll do is I'll have a very small nail or something like that. And I will check to make sure that uh, whatever it is that I'm trying to find, well, maybe not an electrical wire, but, you know, if I'm trying to find that stud, I'm going to put a little nail in there, something that I know that I'm going to cover it up or I can spackle it real easily. Um the other thing is, is that uh, battery operated tools. And again, you know, are you using stud finders all the time? Usually not. And the issue, what happens a lot of times with these stud finders, whether they take nine volt or something along that line, is people will leave them in their toolbox. This is not corroded, but people will leave them in their toolbox for who knows how long. And sometimes that battery has a tendency to leak. Um, so what I will do is if you have a stud finder and you're not, you know, let's say you use it, take that battery out 
and you can put it in a like a plastic container you don't want it touching metal in your toolbox so if you take it out and you store it in your toolbox have a little plastic container or something like that or put some tape over it something along that line because you don't want it to dead out by touching something metal but you also don't want it destroying your your battery operated tool so that one of those things of you know some of these hand tools are battery operated and if they are you have to keep that in mind you don't necessarily want to keep them in long-term storage with that battery in place uh so just the thing to keep in mind because again that stinks to be able to be in that position and then find out that your one and only stud finder doesn't work because the battery's corroded so like i said lots of different styles of stud finders out there little wd-40 or penetrating oil or something along that line this is one of these tools that is really handy to have especially if it's got the little uh sprayer part on the side there's <laughs> a little straw that always gets lost but i'll pick on one thing right here so a lot of times with this style of util or utility knife this gets really grouchy to use what you can do is you can put a quick squirt of that in there and that's going to keep that thing working correctly you'll be able to wipe down the excess that sort of thing oh yeah thank you see my wife knows me I <laughs> so like you said you know making it so that you know tools that are you know movable or anything along that line with these guys here these adjustables again you know if when i'm done using them i give it a quick squirt quick squirt work that in maybe have a paper towel but i don't have one and <laughs> wipe off the excess and also too what i'll do is that little bit of excess i'm going to wipe that thin layer of that oil on that metal tool and it's going to make it so it's not going to run a rust as quite as easily you know same with these again you know you have all these parts and areas where this metal on metal so like you said having some kind of a uh an oil lightweight oil something along that line is going to keep your tools uh, going for quite a while these areas here where metal touches metal in there that sort of thing because again sometimes you're going to get these especially when they're new they're really grouchy they don't want to work too well so like i said having some kind of a little penetrating oil uh you know in your toolbox is a good thing really nice if it has a little sprayer too uh, sometimes I'll just keep that, like again, you know, I'll keep that little sprayer or extra ones in my toolbox because I know that they get lost all the time. Well, I lose mine all the time. So, um, so like I said, having something along that line is really nice. Other ones are wire scrapers, wire brushes, that sort of thing. So like I said, this is nice. Uh, you can get all different sizes and everything else. This is about the standard. Um, like I said, you know, for scraping surfaces, loose paint, that sort of thing. You got a scraper built into it. Like I said, a wire brush. Uh, sometimes you're needing to clean a surface off to be able to, you know, have it so that caulk can be uh, applied or something along that line. So like I said, wire brushes work really nice. Um, and again, sometimes you're going to find that you can get you can get uh different style wire brushes you can get little ones that look like toothbrush size and those are nice if you're getting into situations let's say you have a threaded something you have to thread in and you unthread that thing and it's really corroded and whatnot you can get that smaller wire brush and get in there and clean those teeth out to make it so that it's going to thread in a lot easier but i said wire brush a little scraper along something along that line is really nice to be able to have all right da -da 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 -da. so nail sets they like said nail sets all different types out there you can tell by you know this is a set you know this is for a larger nail head and this is for sinking in nail heads so like just crib nails or something along that line you be able to sink these in to be able to put a, a filler in uh to be able to basically hide things uh to be able to set those nails so you don't you don't have a big old hammerhead leaving marks on whatever it is 
uh, usually trim work or something. But again, these nail sets are one of those things that you don't use them that often, but boy, when you need them, you need them. So like I said, there's always a way you can do it. Some people will use just a nail or something along that line, but that can be a little rough at times. So having a nail set uh, around is a nice addition to most tool sets. So cock guns. They like said different styles of cock guns out there. This is uh this is what you know the most common size is, but they do have a larger size for those larger tubes of glue or whatever. But a size like this is generally good for homeowner use. Uh this is what's called a dripless. What that means is that as I'm squeezing the handle, the plunger moves. It's actually activated through here. And it pushes out whatever product. When it's an emptied out, you pull it out, that sort of thing, and get rid of it. This one also has a, a poker on it built right in so that you can, you know, poke whatever product you have, usually some kind of a silicone or something like that. You have some kind of a, a film or something like that covering it. So you can puncture that. This one also has a cutter right there. Half the time, those things don't work <laughs> all that great for me. I just use my utility knife, but that's what it's for. And some people really like that. Uh, the thing with these is that uh, you may have seen ones that have a little button, release button here to release the pressure. Like I said, this style, the dripless style, is generally good for lighter weight products. The heavier the product is, the heavier caulks, the heavier glues, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, that plunger will have enough strength to push it, but you're going to be feeling it in your hands. So sometimes if you're going to be using some kind of a heavier caulk sealant, whatever it is, so you're working on your gutters or something along that line, you need to use like a butyl caulk or something. This may not have the strength behind it. So sometimes those older styles that have the teeth cut in the bottom and you have to turn it to be able to release that pressure is better. So, like I said, uh, but like painter's caulk and silicone and little things like that, this is great. But again, if you have it where you're having a really hard time, sometimes uh, you can go a step up or two um, to uh, a different style caulk gun will make it easier to be able to use. But having some kind of a caulk gun uh, is always one of those things that's good. Generally, I have two of them because, you know, you're bound and determined to be in the middle of a project and going along and doing whatever and this thing decides to fail on you so i generally will keep at least another one kind of a, as a backup because it's one of those things that it's murphy's law it never fails you know you're in the middle of something and you need to get it done and then your cock gun poops out on you so having a spare sometimes is good all right yeah cat's paw so what this does is and you, I don't know if you can see that in here. What this does is, let's say you have to pull a nail or something along that line, and that nail is sunk all the way in. I'm not going to beat up their table. Well, maybe not. What you can do is here we'll we'll pretend. So let's say this is your nail, right, and it's sunk right in there, and it's flush. You can't you can't get a hammer around it. Nothing. So what you can do is you can get a, you can get the point of this, and a lot of times this is a lot more pointy, and you can get your hammer and whack it like that, and it's going to dig into the wood to be able to dig underneath that head of that nail, and just pry it up enough to where then you can switch over to your flat bar or anything along that line to be able to get into it and pull that nail out. But you said cat's paw is one of those things that are going to make it so you can get some of those items out sometimes. Could you do it with this? Eh, it's work. It will dig in, but it is a lot of work. So something like this is going to make life a lot easier. Um, you know, that's one of those things that you don't use it that often necessarily, but I found it enough to where it's one of those things that you really, when you need it, you really, really do need it. Um, the issue is, though, is that when you use a cat's paw or something along that line, it is going to leave a large hole 
it's going to damage that material uh, that you're pulling it out. Uh, that's kind of just the way it's designed. So uh, keep that in mind. You know, I've seen people use cat's paws on, like, say, trim or something like that they want to keep, and it doesn't look good afterwards. It's fixable. It's always fixable. But realize that that isn't set for that sort of thing. Pencils and markers and all sorts of things. So this seems like a basic thing, right? But you should always have a couple of good number two pencils. And the reason for this is depending on your project, sometimes you want a nice sharp line to be able to make a nice fine mark, um, depending on how close you're trying to cut things. I also like these flat carpenter pencils. The reason they're flat is I can set them down and they're not gonna roll away. If I drop them and I actually step on them, I'm not gonna be taking a drip because I've stepped on a round pencil. Um, you know, they do sell, you know, sharpeners and stuff. You can stick on the end and twist it and whatnot. Most of the time, people just get out of utility. And they're sometimes a little softer lead to be able to mark a little bit easier on whatever it is that you're marking. So, like I said, these generally have a little harder lead. These are a little softer lead. And they'll make a little wider uh, mark. But sometimes you just need a mark to be able to see. So, like I said, a variety of pencils or marking materials I'm going to have and then I'm usually going to have some kind of a marker this is this style but again these markers are nice because they're going to give you a nice dark line and depending on what you're working with if you're working with wet material uh treated material stuff like that sometimes those pencil marks just do not show up at all so having some kind of a permanent marker uh, makes it so that you can actually see what it is because again I've had it, it's happened to me multiple times where somebody's marking something and I get it and I cut it and I look and I say, oh, yep, there's the mark and it's not. And I cut the wood and then I find out that my piece is too short or whatever because I could barely see that mark. So like I said, having something that's going to give you a good mark so you're not, in a sense, wasting material is one of those things that's very handy to have. All right. Proximity tester. This is one of these tools that what it does, what it does, around here, I'll show you what it does. What it does is going to show the proximity of electrical devices, right? So let's say you have a wire or an outlet or something along that line, and you want you're curious if it's good if it's live. So what you can do is a lot of times you have to turn it on, you press it, and I can go over, let's say I want to see if this outlet's live, and I stick it in. And it starts chirping like that, or I can put it right next to this wire. That's a live wire. Having something like this is really nice. Um, you know, does it is it the end all to say something is live? Not necessarily, but it's one of those tools that makes life a lot easier. Yeah, I had a quick story on this. I had one of these. Battery was good. I had checked it just like that. It chirped and everything, and we had a wire, and I held it up there, and. Uh, it didn't chirp, and I checked it again. It didn't chirp, and checked it on another wire, and it did. So I went, okay, the wire is dead. And I got a pair of big side cutters, and I went, Chirp, and blew a hole in my side cutters. My wife was laughing at me the whole time after she realized I didn't blow a hole in my hand. So like I said, proximity tester or something along that line is nice. Uh, it's just one of those little safety things. Speed squares are one of those things where... They're nice because you don't you don't need to know everything that these speed squares can do. Uh, they can do a lot. When you you can buy a book that's literally that thick in all the things that these can do. But as far as you know, having something to be able to give you a nice square edge or a forty five degree or something along that line, or maybe you're using it. You're cutting something, you want a nice straight edge. These are real nice for that. Plus, you can use them for a lot of other different things. Like I said, people get into, uh, you know, cutting hips and all sorts of things with this. So, like I said, there's a lot that can be done with this, but there's nothing wrong with having one of these on your toolbox. They are actually pretty handy. Um, you don't necessarily need, there are metal ones out there and aluminum 
plastic is just fine. And again, as long as you're not beating these things up, uh, they're pretty durable. So a speed square is one of those things, and they're relatively cheap. So I want to touch on that little note real quick. The thing with hand tools is that it, it is expensive. They are really expensive. Uh, they can be extremely expensive. But the nice thing is, is that I love personally love garage sales. Um, you know, if you're looking at, if you're, if you're going into a garage sale and you're wanting to, you know, look for those tools and stuff, um, there are a lot of things that you can actually get for very little money. Um, I have a tendency to kind of steer away from some of those battery operated tools, that sort of things. Levels are one of those things I'm a little leery about getting at garage sales. And the reason is, is that again, you drop them and whatnot, these little bubbles can get out of whack. Um, unless you have one that you know is reading through that you can check. So I am a little leery of those. But, you know, a lot of times, you know, you're going to go and you're going to see just a variety of hammers and, you know, you know, slip joint pliers and adjustable pliers and maybe lock pliers or hacksaws, that sort of stuff. And those are great. Um, some of the things you want to keep an eye out for, you know, you said if you're buying a hammer, and again, small version of it, but, you know, you want to make sure that the the head is not all beat up, that the handle is not all beat up, that sort of thing. Um, that the uh, the actual metal is not mushroomed out. And what I mean by that, I'll draw this out real quick. Any tool that impacts, so let's say that's the head of whatever, it doesn't matter. It could be, you know, any tool that you strike. What's going to happen over time is as it's struck, that metal is going to bulge out like this right and what's going to eventually happen are these pieces come flying off and they break off does that mean that that tool is no longer good no it just means that it needs to be taken care of so a little file or something like that a lot of times people just kind of file these edges and make it so that that struck surface is not necessarily a hazard anymore um so little things like that i'll look at um Sometimes you're going to find something, say, like this, that just doesn't want to turn. Or maybe it's really difficult to turn. But we know what will fix that, right? So we know that we can say, oh, this kind of works. But you know you can take it home and soak it in a little bit of penetrating oil and make that thing actually work again. So like I said, you know, you have to use your, sometimes you have to use a little bit of your knowledge on that. But you can find them at uh you know deeply discounted prices uh because most of the time people are selling them because they really just don't know what they are so like i said you can find out a lot of hand tools at garage sales um i want to pick on these guys <laughs> these are smaller versions but these are called zip ties uh it basically you can buy all different lengths and widths and colors and everything else but it makes it so that I can tie down whatever I need to. And it makes it so that, you know, it binds it out pretty good. And the issue is, is that, you know, once you use them, they're done, right? So, but having a variety of zip ties to me is one of those things kind of like right up there with like duct tape or something along that line. Um, generally, I'm going to have, you know, a roll of duct tape and it sounds cliche and whatnot, but you know how handy that stuff is. So zip ties to me work very nice. Duct tape works also very nice. Uh, the thing about zip ties is, is that if you're using them outside, make sure they're rated for exterior use. Some will break these things down sometimes if they're not rated for that. So like I said, a couple of zip ties, uh, various sizes in your toolbox, one of those things that make life, can make life uh, very much uh, more enjoyable or less frustrating. So. Another little trick I want to say is sometimes pliers like this. Um, again, we talked about in this here where this can get, it can get really corroded uh, and it can make it very hard sometimes to open and close. And I've seen it where actually people got hurt because they can't close it or they have to use two hands to open it up. Um, as goofy as it sounds, sometimes 
dropping a little bit of sand in there and working that sand in there to be able to kind of scarf that out a little bit and make it so that uh, those will actually open and close a little bit easier. The sand is a little abrasive and will actually kind of get in there and be able to work that out. Yes, you have to get it out later, but it's kind of a nice way to be able to break that in. Um, the thing is with hand tools, I'll talk about this for the last five minutes or so, is you have to think about how that tool is going to be used. And what I'm talking about with that is I, I'm really picking on the metal here. So and we, we talked about that, you know, any kind of a tool, a hand tool that's going to be struck uh, or pried or something along that line. So if you have a tool that is falls into that category, right, hammers, flat bars, uh, you know, struck tools like your nail sets, that sort of thing, um, even sometimes these guys, sometimes the tool is really inexpensive strictly because the metal that they've used is cheap. Now, most of the time, it is just an annoyance. Uh, you know, I've seen it where people, you know, uh, have a hammer and they buy it, you know, and, and it does good and still they try to actually pry something. I've seen it where this actually snaps off, right? Now, most of the time, that's not going to be a big deal until you're up on a roof or you're on a ladder or something along that line. And that failure of that metal actually and all of a sudden turns into a major uh, safety issue. Whether that piece is flying up, hitting you in the face, uh, sending you, you know, uh, end over end because, you know, whatever it was you were prying on decided to break. Um, those, struck, those struck tools, again, you know, like I said, you know, the more it's struck, the more it's going to mushroom out. And, you know, like we talked about as far as maintenance on those. But sometimes that metal is just really soft. And you having to find yourself over and over and over again having to file it off or whatever. So sometimes you have to be a little bit more picky. Uh, and this is something we're going to get into a little bit more as far as, you know, some of those tools, as far as those quirks, I guess you want to call them. But, uh, and again, this is part of the reason I like some of the older some of those older uh, tools is that they didn't necessarily skimp out on that metal as much as they do today, as it seems. So I think we're out of time, aren't we? We're good. All right. And like I said, please tune in next week. We'll be getting into some of these hand tools and really getting into some more of these details and how they work and some more of the nuances. And turn it over. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Taylor, for the opportunity to thank everyone tonight that tuned in for us. And uh, to encourage you to join us next week when we go into hand tools and how to properly use them. Ah.